The early Romantics had the belief that the root of all evil was a sense of separate self. And that attitude is carried over into modern Buddhist Romanticism. Where the root of all evil, the root of all suffering, all our troubles come from our separate sense of self. They tell us if we could only erase that sense of self, we'd be happy. But unfortunately, we're taught that sense of self by our society, so we have to unlearn it. But that's not what the Buddha taught. The source, <clears throat> the source of all our trouble, he said, is our heedlessness. Whereas heedfulness is the root of all skillful qualities. And in the very beginning, to be heedful, you do need a sense of self. You think about yourself as an agent who's going to be acting, and as the recipient of those actions. Because you see that your actions will have an impact on you, and it will be determined by the quality of the intention, the quality of the action. That's your reason for being heedful. That's your reason for being careful in what you do. So as the Buddha teaches in mundane right view, you are responsible for your actions. And the sense of responsibility is something you really have to develop. It's an important part of the path. Now, of course, this self that he has you assume is not radically separate. In other words, it's not totally immune from influences outside. In fact, your actions will be largely determined by the kind of people you hang out with, the people you listen to. As he says, those who act unskillfully tend not to listen to the noble ones. Those who act skillfully do listen to the noble ones. This is what the Buddha said, that the whole of the practice is admirable friendship. And having admirable friends lies at the beginning of many of his maps of how the practice progresses. But still, those admirable friends can't do the work for you. As he says, no one can purify you. You can't purify anybody else. You don't go to heaven because of other people's good actions. You don't go to hell because of other people's good actions. It's your actions that determine that. So there's that sense in which you're separate. And of course, you're the one who chooses your friends. So in that way, the separateness of ourselves comes first. You see this even in our relationship with the Buddha. On the one he says he is our most admirable friend. It's because of him that we have this practice. Without him, where would we be? Certainly not sitting here with our eyes closed, washing our breath. But at the same time, he says he only points out the way. It's up to us to follow the way. He gives the analogy of someone who knows the route to Rajagaha and can tell it in a lot of detail. But it's not the case that everybody who hears that or hears those instructions will actually get to Rajagaha. Why? Because they don't follow the instructions. In that case, what can the person who's given the instructions do? So even though we are interconnected to that extent, that we can benefit from his teachings, still ultimately it's up to us as individuals to decide what to do, whether to follow those teachings or not. There was a person who came to see the Buddha one time and said, basically, if someone has found the way, they shouldn't go telling it to other people, because everybody's karma is separate. And the Buddha says, that's basically saying, if someone has wealth, they shouldn't share it with other people. And in saying that, they're causing a lot of 
harm. So again, we're not so radically separate that we can't benefit from listening to one another and, and emulating one another's good habits. And sometimes that emulation is subconscious. But still, we're the one who makes the decisions what to do, what to say, what to think. And this is what the concept of a separate self is useful for, this sense of responsibility. The idea that the buck stops here. If your meditation is not going well, part of it may be due to the fact that you got the wrong instructions, you're staying in a bad environment. But primarily, you have to look at yourself. What are you doing? Some people get the best instructions and they misunderstand them, or misapply them. Imagine what the world would be like if someone said, Why, why is the car smashed? And you were the one who drove it into the telephone pole. But you say, well, it's because of a long line of inter interconnected interactions. And if you didn't take responsibility for what you'd done, if people didn't take responsibility for what they'd done, we couldn't live with one another. But it's not just on the outside world. In our own practice, if we don't take responsibility for our own actions, how are we going to get anywhere? Remember the Buddha's instructions to Rahula. You do something, the results are not good. You turn around and you look at your actions. What did you do wrong? You go to others for help to get some idea of what you might have done wrong, but then you have to go back and make the correction yourself. So the sense of responsibility, which has some link to it, at least to some extent, a sense of a separate self is an important strategy on the path. Without it, we don't we have no way of learning. We don't know where to look. We don't know where to trace out cause and effect. And if we can't see that, what are we going to see? Where are we going to gain any discernment? Because that's what discernment is. We suffer because of our ignorance. Our ignorance has nothing to do with how we define ourselves. It has to do with our understanding of how craving and ignorance, and particularly the craving and ignorance in our own minds, leads to suffering. You don't go looking outside for craving and ignorance. You have to look inside. You have to take responsibility for what you've done. When you know where the problem is coming from, that's when you can clear it up. So the problem comes from within. Unfortunately, the solution comes from within. We get from the Buddha ideas about how we can go about solving the problem. But it is up to us, as individuals to do the work and to gain the benefits. Again, when the benefits come, they don't spill out on the person sitting next to you. They may reverberate, but the actual experience of the deathless that comes is bachatang. That's what we say every day as we chant the, the virtues of the Dharma. It's to be known by the observant for themselves. No one can know this for anyone else. We can't even show it to other people for them to look at. When the results come, they are yours. And as John Lee says, no one else has to know. In fact, when no one else knows, that's when you're really safe. Of course, at that point, the use of a sense of self, especially with final awakening, they say, Leaves no need, or has no longer has any need. <clears throat> so 
sense of self as a strategy. Here we're using it as a strategy for assigning responsibility so that we can fruitfully solve the problem of suffering. And when this problem is solved, we don't need the strategy. In fact, at that point, we don't even need the strategy of not-self. So as long as we have a sense of separate self, learn to use it wisely. Realize that your self is going to benefit from the good influence of other people. And it's because we can have an influence on one another that we've been exposed to the Dharma. Learn the Dharma from what the Buddha and all the many generations between us and the Buddha have done. But it's up to us to take that influence and make the most of it. That's when your sense of separate self, instead of being a curse, is actually a source for true happiness.